Okay. All right, so one thing that you see behind me, it's one of the projects on Digital Rocks portal. Uh, it's actually high resolution uh, imaging inside. This is uh, Ketten limestone. This is oil blob and this is water. And you will actually have the joy of analyzing that image for your next homework, which is about going to be posted right after this class. I did, I wanted to post it on Monday, but then I decided not to load you until you actually finish up your write-ups today. They were due today, right? So that we go in sequence so that I don't overload you. So one of the problems with this new online world is that there are apparently from uh, two extremes. The, your cl classes will either go into not requesting anything at all or requesting double the amount of work. And I'm trying not to do that just because it's online. <laughs> because everybody supposedly has more time now. <laughs> so, so I'm trying to do it sequentially. Uh, so anyway, what you're gonna look at is, so this is again, there's three phases here. So the first part will be segmentation. Uh, this, the behind me, I'm, I'm moving out of the, so behind me is a segmented image uh, or filtered image rather, which is ready for, I think the paper that would be worth double checking, but I think paper actually did um, thresholding segmentation and they possibly slightly over filtered this. It looks like that they use anisotropic diffusion quite a bit. Um, but I will ask you to actually compare the original is a little noisier than this and this one just to see uh, how you appreciate their filtering. And then uh, to use three different segmentations. One is simple thresholding, uh, but there are three phases here. So it has to be iteratively applied. And the second one uh, is VCA segmentation and the third one statistical region merging. Uh, and basically then compare the result to what is posted. Uh, in the on the website that was actually used in the paper that is related publication to the data set. So you can actually then evaluate how you're doing things and what it is that authors thought was a good segmentation. Okay. So that's one assignment. And second time a second one is to use one of those segmentations, uh, whichever you prefer, to do some of these morphological operations. So I'll ask you to erode uh, first compute Euler characteristic of the oil phase in the pore space, and then also erode both step by step, um, and uh, look at how those things are changing as you're eroding the space. That's one way to characterize. And I'll ask you to also do like Euclidean distance of the pore space uh, and compare. So basically Euclidean distance of the entire pore space and then oil blob, as well as uh, the brine separately. So just to see how it is that they uh, change in one space versus the other. And to see whether these distances very actually can see that oil kind of tends to occupy, I keep moving away, all right. The oil tends to occupy mostly the middle of the pore space and uh, the wetting phase. So wetting versus non-wetting phase, non phase behavior. So see whether Euclidean distances can actually characterize that. And I'll ask you to also visualize the surface of this well bed. Anyway, so those will be assignments for your homework to be posted right after this class. All right, let's move to back to medial axis. So today we will try things out. Um, before I actually start, uh, can you see my sp screen? Share screen. All right. So share my screen. I would also like you to double check that you can see at some point on Canvas, I shared my entire folder of data. And there should be some medial axis in there. Can you see this folder? Just double check that you have the data. If not, I will send the data again. So on Canvas, I shared 
I believe my entire data folder. And then you should be you should be able to see a sub sub folder called media access. So let me know if you don't see it. Otherwise, I'm going to assume that you have it. So let's just briefly review uh, what it is that we mentioned uh, last time about media access. So the idea is to produce a skeleton, a, a sort of a thinner version of whatever object you're interested in. And again, when I talk about object uh, in, in, in segmented data world, we're top, typically thinking one of the phases that you see in a segmented image. So that could either be, by agreement, it could either be zero or one or zero or 255. That really depends on what are you referring to. So make sure that whenever the problem is out there, that you clarify uh, what it is that the object of interest is, or possibly the best is to call it by its physical name. So if I'm giving you um, uh, homework, uh, yes, I could talk about zero, one, and two phases in this image if you segment it to zero, one, and two, but physically zero, one, and two is just meaningless. So maybe you want to refer to phases by their physical name. So in this particular case, there's pore space, there's solid phase, there's oil, there's brine, and so forth. So choosing a physical name then should be a little less ambivalent, even if it takes a moment then to relate it to the actual, uh, actual phase or its numerical value. Okay. Now we need, so basically such a skeleton would be a more compact, representation of that space. One version uh, is so-called medial axis. And the way medial axis works is that it starts from a boundary of the object and basically starts moving in, if you will, almost like a grass fire. And wherever, whenever this grass fire or this front moves in and tries to claim two, two uh, grass, grass fires coming from different uh, uh, different directions claim one voxel. That voxel is like or pixel is labeled as a candidate. Okay? And then after all of the candidates are uh, so basically such candidates such as here in two D, they're they are equidistant at least to two boundary voxels. Okay, so this solid solid or black phase. Um, I'm equidistant to at least two, this point is, okay? And in 3D, that's a little often, uh, that's often a little more complex um, to look at, but nevertheless, uh, it still uh, persists as a, as a concept. So if you look at this uh, cuboid here in 3D, there will be an entire sort of platelets, uh, platelet of such voxels that are equidistant from both top and bottom boundary in this particular case. Okay. Now that just gives us candidates. After that, we have to thin it down. And even if we thin it down, it's not necessarily straightforward. So the problem is that any little crevice in the, in the, in the, in the, or little nook in the, uh, along the boundary will create sort of a separate medial axis path trying to reach to it. And you can see the result of it here. It's almost like a fractal uh, behavior, if you will. And any noise will cause a wreck. So you typically want to have a nice, nicely denoised image before you actually attempt to do this. So let's actually try that out. Um, let's try out this matest.png. And that should that reportedly sits in uh, that shared folder. So that would be the one. There's a TIFF file and there's a PNG file. And if they're both in there, that means that at some point there was possibly an issue. So we will explore that as we go. And there's test 1A. Huh, okay. Um, we will open now and see. Uh, Dr. Pudanovich, I, I don't see the folder that you were mentioning before. You don't see? Okay. 
So let me reshare again, and I'll actually just share this specific folder. Box. Um, this Okay, Canvas, my computer should learn by now that when I'm searching for Canvas, it's UT's Canvas, okay. So all kinds of data, this is the folder. By the way, so I'm gonna reshare. I'm gonna send again. Uh, uh, okay, I was looking for it in, in the files section, so that was my oh, no, 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 mistake. No. That's too large for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> when I say all kinds of data, that's basically entire courses in there. Has everybody else found it? So this should work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So inside the, that folder, there is media access folder. Yeah. All right. Let's try. Let's see what kind of trouble can we get into. Uh, so there's MA test one and test one A. Uh, if I remember, well, let's just try. It open. There we go. I apparently opened TIFF. So let's just see. Value zero, value 255. So let's just play with that a little. So if I, uh, so there is skeletonized two, three, uh, 2D, 3D. I think it's somewhere here versus this is me attempting to remember and this is too big of a list anyway so I'm just going to search for it there we go so it's there is binary skeletonized that one works only in 2d so in this case it would work um, but there's another plugin that is 2d 3d um, so that's the one we'll run because we will want to do a 3D later. Okay. So this is my skeleton. Now the result of this is you can see basically it's 255, or should be 255, yes. So it's also a segmented image in terms of representation. So that's something to think about. So when I initially said, well, technically in this particular case, it's it's it, I see one, two, three, four, five paths. Those paths are not recognized as such. So remember that. They're simply a part of the phase. So this is not broken into, it's not a graph right now. It's just a set of paths. Okay, so that is the image. Now let's go with the same test. And if you want to test the rectangle, there's a rectangle right there. 
Uh, but let's just work with this. This is very similar to rectangle, actually, the, this image. <laughs> Topologically, it's the same. Uh, <laughs> uh, so essentially, the, the medial axis is topologically similar to that of a rectangle as well. Let's just bring that uh, same image again. And let's now actually add some noise. So I'm just going to go to that salt and pepper noise. That's quite a bit of noise, but that will nevertheless uh, prove our point. And let's actually try to um, do this same skeletonize. It's gonna be a little extreme, but. It's pretty from the numerical standpoint or a graph standpoint, it's a mess. So essentially I see sort of a loop of paths around every speckle in that image. Did everybody get that? Yes. Yeah. Now this can be hilarious if you ever want to conceal um, your image. So take a quick photo, grab a photo from either yourselves or whatever it is that you'd like to. I'm actually going to grab a photo from my, my Zoom should have my photo. Here's my Zoom. So grab a photo. I'm going to grab one from online. Anybody's face. I'm just going to type into face in Google and see what I get. Grab somebody's face from images. All right. There's some that are deformed here. Let me find something not deformed. Whoa, mine. I don't know. I might go back to, here we go. Here's a regular face and save. And then try to look for that. I'm not sure where I saved it. Let's do this again. I think I saved it in some spring 2020 folder. So pick a face. Yeah, I saved it in my transport. Okay, face. Okay. And then drop that into your medial axis. This is just a fun way uh, to just look at these medial axis, but I'd like to open. Let's do it. Okay, so I'm going to create a black and white image out of it. Okay. And I'm going to binarize it. And I'm just now going to go with default. Uh, no, I will not. I will do Otsu. Analyze. Threshold. Just threshold. There's something where that face is actually visible. So something like that. Apply. And then you can, I'm gonna invert this. And now I'm gonna skeletonize. Ah, uh, this didn't turn out very well. It can be a nice, interesting way to obscure images. You can still see some elements of a face in here. 
but it's now completely obscured. So it's, if you want to ever hide your identity on your social profiles online, you can process your, your own photo with this and see how it turns out and then post that instead. Anyway, this was just a fun way, but basically you can see here, we have eyebrows actually, and there's around the eye, there is this entire loop uh, that has to be contained as part of the medial axis. You can also test this 3D, uh, this uh, test three, if you'd like, just to see how you will go into this one crevice um, and then if you have this, well, we can do, since it's quick enough, we can do all of these things. So if I do skeletonize, okay. You can see that basically, if I have an inclusion in that, uh, that's a cavity essentially in the image, I'm gonna have a loop around that cavity. Did everybody uh, get to test? <laughs> why, why the algorithm gives like a different result depending on the image um, format? PNG versus TIFF? Yes. That's probably why I have, there is compression that is going on in PNG. And that compression, I believe, uh, results in um, slightly, not just zeros and 255s, but possibly there are some other phases in there. Can you check that quickly? Yeah, because I, I tried the MA test one. So if you um, do a histogram, see whether you see any other values other than zero and 255. Okay, let me just do that. Can you see? And I think that's, that's often a result of compression. So in my case, I only see zero and 255 on the PNG. And I also saw a difference in the medial axis. Hmm. Let me try. Did the first one probably. And actually it's the TIFF image that has other values of the PNG. It seems, well, this is still a correct, so I use the TIFF and I did get a correct result. Did you use skeletonized 2D, 3D? Yeah. Yep. Yes. Now let me try. Let me try to reproduce. Come on. No, this is TIFF. So. What is PNG? Is rectangle PNG? Let me try to open. With open, I might see different. Um, So one A is PNG, let me try. So it is eight bit, 255 and zero. Analyze histogram. Yeah, it's only zeros and 255s. Oh, 
oh wow <laughs> so here is my assumption um even though the images they look the same and both have zeros and 255s one of them had ever so slightly different um boundary values so near the boundary they differ yeah but that that's that's the weird thing because i did the same for the png and i got i have a different result to what you got well when you see so let me see all right when we do when we do this is the susceptibility to noise so there was on some level somewhere these images are ever so slightly different and that's what results uh, in a image now the second part so there is definitely here i can see do you see this here mm -hmm. i don't think that was there in my tiff image and that's what resulted in that third one coming in can you share your screen to see what you're seeing so that sure. i can see what you're seeing oh you need to uh let us share i need, to, I need to let go <laughs> let yeah. me see meeting controls oh come on oh there they are uh new share no i need to stop sharing maybe stop share so i'm gonna stop right now try uh, you need to still like let us like activate multiple multiple sharing. Okay, Go okay, ahead. now now I can. Okay, so this one is from the TIFF image, and mm -hmm. this one with the PNG image, and this is my my result. So I I'm not even seeing like the boundaries. Yes. On, so ah uh, okay, this one has pruned the results. So basically this one has uh, these two removed but that's post-processing and same thing is here so somewhere this is this is basically post-processing of the medial axis into a backbone so this might be something to do with the settings and i'm not sure that's a good question where the settings are in skeletonized 2d 3d so it must be that you have ever so slightly different settings that basically post-process and remove uh, these ends. Okay. Okay. And they also sometimes shorten. So that's setting somewhere. Setting that's a, that's a good actually uh, good uh, little research. These to to do where the settings are and what are they set to. So actually, that's a great, uh, well, we will discuss that further, but that's actually, that's something to, I'm going to write down and uh, look into. Uh, but that's essentially filtering, if you will, of the medial axis. So often, really, truly, what I think this object, the starting object, is actually, I'm going to stop sharing and, uh, and uh, share now mine. Um, what i'm thinking uh of this object do you, do you see the one that i'm showing yes the original so what i think about really when i think about it kind of as a simple representation i would like to have that one stick right i mean what are those two things up there <laughs> i don't want them uh, in my uh in my simplification of the object so some of the algorithms have immediately post-processing to prune it's called pruning these uh, leaf uh, the the they're called branch leaf paths that are just hanging as open ends and they can remove those and just leave the backbone so somewhere in the settings is that the case for everyone or just javier and danny no i had the same like two different yeah, yeah danny had the same yeah. everybody else is everybody else having the same result yeah it's 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 the same it's the same so just one line or the same as mine i got what you got okay 
So it's something in the settings. I'm actually gonna research where those settings are, but that's basically the difference. Okay. And we're gonna comment on that, so I'm gonna continue. Uh, so you see, this is thinned MA candidates. So this is skeleton version. Uh, hello. Uh, hello. You see, uh, there are three files, right? MA test one, MA test one, TIFF, MA test one PNG, and then MA test one APNG. Yes. So one of them, I got the result that you were getting, and then one of them is just one straight line. Okay. So. So all three files are. Uh, different. Slightly different. So. Yeah. Did everybody try, so Javier, when you try TIFF image, do you get what I get? Yes. So when you try PNG, you get a slightly different result. That's, that is correct. But I'm actually trying on the third image. I just realized that there was that third image. So I'm just trying it right now. Just for kicks. <laughs> yeah, just to see so if that... It, yeah, so th that that is the thing. Like the one that you open when you did the PNG is that name uh, MA test one A, and that mm -hmm. one is where you see like the three the three uh, branches at, at the end, mm -hmm. and the PNG um, test one PNG is where you only get the backbone. Okay, so I think still that that's something to do with the slight different the tiff and png likely have very slight differences in the way they discretize this image so let me look at this okay very slight difference in this boundary can cause a, a sort of like a new branch to go out there and these slight differences it's the compression in png i'm guessing the tiff doesn't have compression is the compression in png that can ever so slightly change those boundary pixels so even though i have zeros and my initial uh, assumption was that compression has changed some values to intermediate values but it could also be that it's simply causing a slight change in this near the boundary. Here, there's nothing to change. Compression is everything is the same within the, in, in the middle of the phase. And because of that change, that will result in um, uh, slight, slight differences in the way algorithm operates. So that's, but it seems that either way, this algorithm does have some pruning. In this case, it doesn't prune a path that goes to descend. And if this is ever so slightly smoother boundary, then it might actually prune it. And that depends on how long that path is. So the, what we actually have just now discovered is how sensitive we already knew in extreme case of if I drop this salt and pepper noise, that I'm gonna get these um, differences, but also in a very, what's relatively small changes near the boundary, I'm going to suddenly uh, have a slightly different result. We also know like from the last time, uh, also this, but this shouldn't be different on all of these different implementations. Uh, presumably the software works the same for all of us and processes the uh, pixels in the same order for all of us. But if it didn't, if you suddenly started processing uh, pixels from right to left instead of left to right, you might actually get slight differences in the result as well, ever so slightly shifted. So that's something that is simply there because of the digitized uh, world and the susceptibility to digital noise. Okay. All right. So like just quickly, I tried like to like erode or dilate the image to try to fix the boundaries. It still mm -hmm. didn't work. I'm still getting the, like not getting <laughs> just the back. <laughs> Good. So. A research project. Okay. So I'm <laughs> actually going to see the actual differences in what I can discover on the TIFF versus PNG so that we don't spend up. But this is this this can drive you crazy, the differences in how um, small changes in an image actually what they result in. in the result. So 
whenever reporting results overall, um, plus minus a path and small things. So you should basically try to focus on how these results um, behave as an ag aggregate or statistically. Um, technically this one backbone versus just a couple of paths is not a huge deal of difference, though of course you do want to understand what caused the change. And I'm actually gonna show a case that is, I have it here, that is a little bit extreme. So this is, if you have a, a segmentation that has this boundary, which technically I should have done open close, but this is just an example where it hasn't been uh, so if the uh, done, so if the boundary is extremely fuzzy and it hasn't been smoothed out, then you are going to have this medial axis path kind of go into these crevices. Uh, so every crevice separately, and you're going to get a noisy a result uh, of medial axis as a result. What's often done is what's called pruning of dead ends. This uh, in 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 uh, graph theory lingo those are branch so this path here is branch branch this path here branch branch this one is branch leaf so there's a pruning of all of these dead ends branch leaf paths so if you prune all of them you can also put a filter i want to prune those that are this long or that long and uh, or there there's certain threshold in length so if you prune all of them What's left even in this image is a backbone as this, okay? Now you will also notice that there's a little bit of, again, order of how you process things and you can get slightly different results and that can kind of drive you nuts. So technically, the moment I prune a path, like for instance, this one, this branch leaf is pruned, and then what is what used to be a branch branch in some cases path is not a branch path anymore so basically you can see that for some reason it this entire thing here has been is left but this part has been pruned and that choice also depends on what is the order in which you process things. Um, ultimately, you don't want to go all the way down and remove all of the paths because as you start removing all branch leaves, um, th those that or originally were not branch leaves will become branch leaves and that can be a problem. So again, the, the, the algorithms, they're, they're recursive in nature and that's part of the problem uh, of how this proceeds. Yeah. Now, um, there's also a question whether, and one would like all of these, wherever I have merger of different paths, to be actually what we call a pore in, um, in, in a porous medium. Mm -hmm. So basically, in this simplified case, I would like to um, uh, I would like to, this is a pore that has four throats attached to it. And we haven't gotten into pore throat network uh, concepts that actually, that is coming up. But basically I would like these medial axis uh, clusters where, where, actually, where I'm actually having multiple paths come together. I would like that to be a center of a pore. And that's also prone to noise, if you will, a lot, because here in this particular setting, I will technically, even in this simplified sketch, I will get two bran branching points of the medial axis within a pore. And I can see in this image how a branching point of medial axis, again, I have way too many inside one pore. Mm -hmm. So here I will have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth. So it's not a one-to-one, -one, even though one would really want that to be the case, uh, that's not the case. One could try to merge them by proximity, which is uh, suggested here, but that's, that's a complex issue as well. So even though one would want the branching point of a medial axis to be, um, to be 
center of a pore. It's not a one-to-one -one -to relationship. And specifically, these issues with digital noise um, prevent that uh, robust concept, uh, application of that concept as well. So here's just some example uh, media here. So this is um, this was a polyethylene surface. So by the way, polyethylene um, is often fused from polyethylene uh, granules or powders, and that results in a porous structure. So polyethylene is used in various applications, and sometimes this is going to be tubing or side of the tubing. But essentially, my PhD thesis it was actually a model oil wet medium. And um, essentially, it kind of looks quasi sandstony because it's the granules of polyethylene that were fused and merged into a medium. Uh, the, and one can actually have different uh, pore sizes within. So this is actually, there was a 100 cube image and each pixel was about four microns. So this is about 0.4 millimeters on a side and you can see pore structure within. Medial axis essentially, shows me and here on the uh, to juxtapose here's a very regular this is just a regular digitization of a hexagonal sphere packing similar to the ones that you analyze in um, petrophysics course uh, for porosity and all kinds of other cases so basically you can see by medial axis of the pore space in 3d you can see kind of the pathways again this is not necessarily the mergers of these paths are not one-to-one -one with pores, but we can see that inside there were this, the coloring is where you are further away of the uh, nearby grain. Uh, you will see the blue and velvet colors, so it's a kind of rainbow coloring, and where, we, where you are very close to the grain, you will see red. So it's basically colored by distance to the grain. And you will see some of these are in, in the middle of the pore space. So you can see also what the tortuosity of going through the pore space is. And you can see the structure. So for to me, this is valuable in conceptualizing how complex is my pore space that I'm flowing through if I'm fluid and how regular is it. So we can see in hexagonal sphere packing, I'm going to have a very regular structure in medial axis as well. So it gives a quick visualization because otherwise visualizing three-dimensional pore space is problematic because things are always occluding the view. Okay. This is how medial surface uh, looks like. So medial surface are those pixels or voxels that I'm starting from before I actually thin this object down. And what's interesting to me, this was actually a naturally fractured carbonate sample that had both bugs and fractures present. And what was interesting to me just in appreciating, even though it's a highly irregular structure, it was obvious, obvious from medial surface that we actually have fractures because suddenly this medial surface, instead of like branched out mess like it is here in the back, it becomes planar. So fractures you can observe by these sort of like planar sheets of uh, voxels. Okay? Now this, was, this is a carbonate, so carbonate is never simple to look at. But this one actually had, again, it had, I, I think I showed some of this, I unfortunately don't have, the, don't have it in these slides right now, but I think I showed it at the very introduction of this course. This behind is a VUG. And again, because it's a sort of like an open space structure, these candidates before thinning it down uh, with medial axis, these are all of the candidates that you start from that, is, that are ultimately thinned down to something like this. Okay. And you can see again, sheets of voxels. And even when you would thin this structure down, you would thin it down to sort of like, um, it would still be planar, but you would have basically multiple paths um, of the medial axis sort of stuck on a plane. Um, so it's actually an interesting uh, thing to observe. Okay. This is our... Um, friend Berea Sandstone, we've, we've seen this image already during the segmentation. So this is basically in three dimensions, this is one slice through it. And in three dimensional space, this is how uh, the paths through uh, Berea Sandstone look like. And I, I should mention that this is after some cleaning up of the medial axis. 
I don't know now anymore which filters, all of the filters I use, this was actually from my PhD thesis, uh, what are the, all of the filters that I used, but I def definitely pruned some of the branch leaf, um, branch leaf uh, paths on this medial axis. What's obvious from here is something that we were also looking at when we were looking at finding con connected uh, regions is the connectivity of 2D versus 3D. This image doesn't percolate, like the white spaces, which is the pore space here, does not percolate in 2D. So I cannot get through the white, spot, uh, white spaces from one side to the other. Okay? Whereas in 3D it does, the moment you get the ability to go up and down, you will actually get connectivity. So something that is 20% porous typically doesn't percolate in 2D, but it does in 3D. It's actually considered, sandstones are considered well connected compared to the rest of the materials we work with. Okay? So that's something to also bear in mind as down the line, we will start introducing fluid flow in these um, as a concept and basically you cannot work with two dimensional media. With any kind of two dimensional media, you have to thin down the structures to actually create them. Uh, is anybody or has anybody worked with micro models in this group of people? So we have visited uh, Dr. Ven Song's lab. And basically, if you wanted to create a micro model, everybody remembers micro models? Yeah. Yeah. So if I wanted to create a micro model that resembles a sandstone, this would be a starting point, and often people start from this, but that's not, you can't, you can't, it doesn't percolate. So what is typically done, done is some sort of an erosion algorithm. So let me actually show you how micro models that are similar to this look like on digital rocks portal barrels. So, Dr. Yashar Mehmani, who, who graduated from our department and is currently working uh, in Stanford with Dr. Hamdi Chalepi, he has done simulation, and I'm going to now visually briefly. So there's no lack of sandstones on this portal. So this is actually how a micro model. Does everybody see my screen? Yes. Yeah. This is an artificial micro model where basically they just put a structure of disks uh, or a masks of disks, and then you can. Uh, this is. Um, to fluid displacement in a micro model. Uh, however, if you want to produce some air, it is. So cover image, I don't think the others, let's see, Berea micro models, so regional data. So this is basically, you kind of have to artificially separate grains and introduce these channels in between and this is uh, for this uh, watershed algorithm that we are going to uh, work on in this lecture as well can be used. <coughs> and then you basically erode the grain spaces to make these artificial connections. So this is how a micro model that resembles Berea looks like. So this two dimensional connectivity is artificially introduced. And you can, if you are having fun, well, download this Berea TIFF and create quick, skeletonize it quickly with the understanding that different implementations might give slightly different results. Okay. So this is an example. Um, the next analysis, just one of the, analyses that I did actually quite a bit ago. Uh, what I want you also to understand is that you, when you upscale and downscale images, you might actually change the connectivity. 
So I'm going to show that on a uh, sample uh, segmented image. So what I was asking as a question is like, how does my connectivity, how do my paths through the image change as I um, upscale and downscale my image? So that's just a very brief uh, example that I'm going to show. Uh, so here is, this is the Texas Pipe Creek Vagi Outcrop. So this is where it was originally taken from, River Basin area. This area, these are limestones, they have these caprinid fossils with them. And these caprinid fossils from Cretaceous era um, wreak havoc <laughs> in the, in the uh, pore space. So basically you can see there are some of these vags, some of them are partially filled some of them are open. There's this matrix that is actually poorly resolved when you do a CT scan. And this is how the sort of one slice through this image looked like. This was a 300 cube subset. And I don't say what the resolution was, but let's just take this sample as such. And this is a three, so you can see some of these openings. And my, uh, I coarsened this image by using majority rule. So then I had a hundred cubes. So I took three by three, uh, by three, each three by three by three and coarsened it and then coarsened it further. So you can actually see if you do that on a segmented image, basically how, how, how it goes. So if I look at the porosity, that coarsening rule did not really change porosity. If you just look at it as a percentage, it went from 17.8 to 16.9. So changed by one percentage. Nothing to call home and write a letter about. Right? And also when I looked at the connectivity, and by connectivity here, I mean, what is the fraction of the largest connected components uh, with respect to the rest of the pore space? So this largest connected component takes about 83.3% of the space in this image, and that just increases to 84.7. So that's not a huge change either. But when I look at the medial axis and the connectivity of the entire image, that changes in a drastic way. So this is the connectivity via medial axis of the original, and this is this 50 cube. So a whole lot of it got disconnected here. Um, and basically, when I also look at the, the, these are the shortest paths from top to bottom. That's one way to look at the connectivity. So my shortest path from top to bottom, um, any kind of pixel on the top down to the bottom. So I kind of have two major pathways to go through. And here I have very similar but here it seems that there is another path that kind of opened up and some of them got closed because of this region that got changed in a major way. So just be careful that this coarsening or manipulation of the segmented image uh, might actually uh, change what your connectivity means. And I do look at medial axis to tell me something about connectivity of my course. Um, you could use the medial axis path statistics if you actually do break it down into a path. Um, you can take those segments and look at their lengths. Again, I would be careful. It's as long as you use the same algorithm on all of the things that you're comparing. And as long as you understand that medial axis in itself is not a poor throat network, then this is okay. It's a characterization as any other. Uh, but I would tend to be uh, careful about it. It's one way to characterize the image, but given the susceptibility to noise, uh, be careful about it. And definitely throw away small, uh, short paths when you're doing the statistics because there will be a lot of noise. Okay. And you can also, I look at this as a sort of anisotropy in the image. Um, I look at the shortest, I use medial axis to find the shortest paths across XYZ directions. And distribution of those XYZ shortest paths enable me to sort of look at the tortuosity of the paths and their distribution. And if I see any major differences in XYZ directions, then I know that I'm working with a slightly anisotropic medium. 
and I call that geometric tortuosity evaluation. So the benefit of it is that you can sort of t say something about how fluid flow uh, would go in this image without actually doing fluid simulation, which can be a major undertaking. So it's one way to analyze things. Um, I tend to get that the average geometric tortuosity, especially in sandstones, is about 1.8. Um, now that differs from medium to medium. So here is how it changes both connectivity and tortuosity, how it changes with some numerical cementation. So if you start with uh, Castlegate sandstone, at this one, oh, there's actually, I don't know whether this link is allowed. It's a good question to double check. I'm just checking whether the link is still correct. It's not correct, but actually this image has since been posted so I need to update my it's since been posted on digital rocks and it's actually I'm going to show you the project this one this is by Adrian Shepard from ANU and there's actually what's nice about this project um it it's one of the early ones and it has a nice selection of different media so there is a sand packing that, that looks like this in a cross section and it's pretty uneven sand so it's not a uniform sand there is a limestone in all its joy and then there is a sphere packing as, as pretty as they come and the Castlegate sandstone, this is the one that I showed you. Uh, so these are all segmented images that you can work with. If you need a nice selection of different images, um, that's one. And this was, this was originally posted as a network generation comparison by network meaning poor throat network, but it never took off for people. I, I've used this a lot and I've used this in a number of papers that uh, I produced, but uh, I, it never actually took off as a network comparison forum, but they're nevertheless use, uh, useful. And you can see that the, there has been a, quite a number of downloads too. So I will show you uh, how does connectivity change and how this um, skeletons can be used to um, look at it. So what I did is I took the original um, image, sandstone image, which was segment posted as segmented, and that had a porosity of 20%. And then I basically grew the boundaries, which you can do by a simple dilation of the boundaries algorithm, though I used level sets for that. And I got something that had a porosity of 10%. So basically these are the visualization of the solid boundaries or uh, the pore space solid boundary in both cases. And this is the medial axis. And this is medial axis of the 10%. You can immediately see that there's more red. So more of those that are labeled close to the grain, which has to be because now I have 10% as opposed to 20%. What's also interesting immediately to see um, is that there is, it, apparently there's a large grain sitting right here causing a hole <laughs> in the medial axis um, and that also caused some uh it's it's this image is not isotropic because of that because that disproportionately affects one of the directions as opposed to the others so here's how tortuosity this geometric measure of um length of going across the medium. So basically for each path that is identified on medial axis of going from one side to the other, you divide that path by the length of that side to side to see how longer do you have to travel. And generally you have to travel anywhere between 1.5 and two. And you can see uh, for the 10% are the dotted, uh, this dashed lines and for 20%, uh, they're the solid lines, so you can see how they change. So specifically this X direction went from distribution from this one to this one. So there's quite a bit of disconnections that happened and make these travel times longer. And that's basically that grain 
that one had to go around uh, that disproportionately affected the x direction as opposed to the others. But overall, you can see that in that particular case, you basically go from an average somewhere uh, 1.65 to somewhere around 1.85 or so. Okay? So you can see that not only that you're making your pore spaces tighter, also, tortuosity through the medium um, increases as uh, the porosity decreases. So that's something to think about, again, in terms of fluid flow. Uh, so in summary, how do we use medial axis? It reduces the complexity of the space or object that you're uh, uh, analyzing, but it preserves its topology and how things are connected. So this gives effective pathway connection and visualization in 3D. You can also do topological analysis. So it's connectivity of that object is the same as it, of the original pore space. In particular, if you were to compute uh, tortuosity, uh, it's way easier to do that on medial axis than in the original medium. The search space of the original medium is usually too much. And it's also a search tool. Um, it can be a search tool for pore throat analysis, though in itself is not a flow model and not an effective uh, pore throat method. Okay. Um, so the rest of the class, we have about 10 minutes as basically look at the beads. So we had example where we had that very simplified objects. Now let's grab one of those, um, beads images and just see what would medial axis uh, look like. So I'm just going to show and then you can try it out. And I'm pretty, uh, so there is a prune cycle method. So this is if you look at the 2D version of this, then there is a binary skeleton eyes, um, which cannot be used for 3D data, but this is for 2D data. And basically you can see that in this particular case, if I have an object such as this one that I'm going around, I'm going to have a path or a cycle of paths around it. So basically we'll have sort of a cycle of paths around all of these. And technically these paths, they're moving through the center of the pore space, give or take. The center of the pore space is often a little difficult to define. If you choose pruning, so this is this part where um, I have to basically for those TIFF and PNG images, I have to go back to that skeletonized 2D, 3D uh, to see what are the options in there that are causing um, differences. But you, you can also test that uh, with uh, analyzed skeleton, you can prune these ends. And if you start pruning them, so for instance, this end, here will be pruned and this end will be pruned and that will cause a disconnection. Now here, there is something else here that happened. And I'm not sure if there is a disconnection in here, but again, uh, so some of these outcomes might be ever so slightly um, surprising. So here I think there is a break that is actually not so easily visible on the path, but because of that break, both of these ends are pruned. So let's play with that a little. Um, and then there's a 3D example where we can use um, only that 3D version of the algorithm. And But I would, uh, for, for the medial axis of that segmented data, uh, I would ask you first to keep only um, keep only the major connected component and then look at its medial axis. So those are our examples to play with in the class. So play yourself. And I'm going to open up one of them. Actually, while you are playing with the 2D one, so we played with 2D already. I'm going to play with the 3D version because I haven't, with these things, it's always good to double check that they're working the same. It's this one, okay. Okay. 
import bra. It's 100 cube. So again, this is the my original segmented subset. So what I want to do is I want to find connected regions. And I'm going to So this is my connected region, the main one. Okay. So I think this is there's again multiple implementation of this algorithm so there's skeletonized to the 3d but i think bone j has a version as well okay this is just 2d 3d Bonje is written in British English, so it's skeletonized with S. And you see that 3D dimension, third dimension, it's extremely hard to see that this is actually connected because it's so thin. Right? So we need some sort of a 3, 3D visualization. And let's see whether 3D viewer work okay mm -hmm. let's go with red uh threshold don't do any resampling Okay, it's working. Last time I did this, I had a Mac. Edit. You show bounding box.
and you can rotate. You can even get a movie as a result. Interesting. Okay. Did everybody get some 2D or 3D result? I don't see any feed. I don't hear any feedback. <laughs> Hello. Any results? Nobody's answering. Do you hear me? Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> There's yes, a just... odd silence for a long time. <laughs> so what are you working on? Are you working on 2D or 3D? Uh, I'm working on 2D. I did okay. like the skeletonization. Um, okay. I tried like both the bone jay and the Okay, well, so yeah, there will be differences. So I'm gonna stop the class here. I did record how I got 3D, but that's also on your slides. Uh, slides. Make sure when you, this is, we didn't mention too much about visualization, but here you display is volume, meaning that it's gonna kind of try to do a shading at every pixel of the region, like these values of 255, 255 kind of volumetrically. You do not want to resample, there is a resampling here factor. Resampling will speed things up, but it will essentially resample or coarsen your original image. And you don't want to do that for medial axis because connections will disappear. So medial axis is very thin. You don't resample to visualize it or else it'll just break the connections. Resampling works for larger objects in general but not not here so that's just a comment okay and you display as a volume don't do surface visualization either not for medial axis but this 3d viewer can actually visualize surfaces um, and can be used but in medial axis there's the, the object is not thick enough to look at the surface of it okay all right well i will stop the class here unless you have some questions and then maybe uh, so just finish the play with and show me the results at the beginning and we can actually comment on all of the differences um that you get for different types of pruning okay okay so so when i'm using a 3d viewer i don't get to see any colors within it even though i change the colors from uh, white red but it still stays the same it's a black box so you just see empty box? Yeah. Did you resample? Uh, no. Uh, I, had sure. I think I had a resampling factor of two. Don't just do two. Try two. one. The object is so thin that you will typically, in a resampling box, two by two by two or three by three by three, whatever is the resampling, majority of the voxels will be black and your result will be black. Does that make sense? It's basically median filtering if you think about it. If you filter this <laughs> medial axis, it's gonna disappear. Yeah, now it's so thin, showing. right? Mm -hmm. But do you see why? That's what resampling means. It's essentially gonna do a majority filter. And for thicker objects that have some robustness to it, that works. But for a thin object like medial axis, you're just gonna destroy it. Okay. So I guess resampling works as designed, but it's just not, not a good to apply to anything thin. And that's something to also think about in general as filtering. 
filtering, like especially median or majority filters, they work well uh, when objects are thicker. In thinner objects, they're going to destroy connections because those connections are extremely sensitive to resampling. That's essentially what I showed with that coarsening exercise too. But here, if you actually do it, then the 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 the, the viewer doesn't know what you're viewing and medial axis in itself is a very so it's still a segmented object it's just treating it as a segmented uh, volume of something that is very thin uh, okie dokie i okay. see you Thank on you. monday ecu on monday <laughs>